We are going to mercilessly break down the barriers that stop a lot of people from learning Rust. Now Rust has this reputation for being a really hard language to learn, but when you distill it down to the things that are hard to learn about it, it really comes down to about two core concepts. Sure, the other parts of the language are different, generics are different, if else statements are different, loops are different, but they're not really different from other languages on a fundamental level. There's some syntactic sugar there, but for the most part, they're easy to learn. In this video, we're gonna quickly tackle those two core concepts so the rest of your Rust journey can be downhill. We're gonna walk through each of these concepts one by one using basically the same code example, and we're gonna keep it as simple as possible. We're really not going to go over about 25 lines of code or so. Let's start. The first thing we're going to do is make the simplest struct ever. It's just going to have one i32 field and we're going to derive the debug trait so that we can print it out. So yeah, that's as simple as it gets. And if you're not aware, the derive macro actually automatically generates an implementation of the trait that we pass in. So in this case, that's debug. Don't worry too much about that for now. That's not one of the hard concepts we're talking about in this video. Then we're gonna have a function that all it does is print out the struct. When we pass these curly braces and then colon question mark, that tells the formatter to use the implementation of debug to print out this struct. Again, don't worry too much about that. That's not what we're focusing on for this video. For our purposes right now, all this is doing is printing out the struct. Now let's write our main function. We're gonna create an instance of this struct and we're gonna try to print it out twice and we'll see what happens here. Okay, so on line 13, we have an error here. What is this? So it says on line 12, value is moved here. So some struct is defined on line 11, and then we're passing it into print on line 12, and then we're passing it into another print on line 13. And this is saying the value is moved on line 12. And the reason that is, is because Rust, by default, when you pass a variable into a function, the function takes ownership of the memory for that variable. This can cause a lot of pain for people that are learning the language because it's nothing like any other language before Rust, but this is what gives Rust its superpower. Hours. In garbage collected languages, you never have to worry about deallocating memory because the garbage collector does it for you. And in C and C++, you do have to worry about deallocating memory. And if you don't deallocate memory in C and C++, you're going to get a seg fault. Rust uses a concept of ownership and borrowing to ensure that no memory is deallocated before the last point at which it's used. If that happens, you'll get compile time errors instead of runtime errors. And that's a great thing. All this makes things a little more difficult for the developer, but it's also what gives Rust an advantage over other languages both in terms of performance and in terms of safety. So when you run into an issue like this and the compiler is saying that a value is moved before you reference it, how do you fix it? Well, I'm gonna give you three ways to fix this issue. Which of the three makes most sense depends on the situation. The first way we can fix this is by implementing clone on some struct. And all that looks like is, like we did with debug, we can just implement the clone trait automatically. And because i32 is it's a primitive and under the hood that implements clone as well, there's no specific implementation we need to write here to make that work. So now that we implement clone, we can simply call dot clone on some struct on line 12 and that's gonna fix the issue. But watch out because it's actually making a complete copy of some struct, which in any situation that's somewhat performance critical, that's not gonna be ideal. So just be aware of that before you implement the clone trait. The second way to fix this is to implement the copy trait. And copy and clone get mixed up a lot and they do roughly the same thing. They both wind up making a full copy of the object that you're passing into the function. And the other thing about copy is that if you implement copy, you have to implement clone as well. So we're gonna add copy onto this list of traits to derive from. The big difference between clone and copy is that one is explicit and the other is implicit. Let me explain what I mean. With clone, you have this dot clone method that you can call on the struct. And so it's very clear when I'm copying it because you see this dot clone in the code. With copy, by default, instead of moving the ownership of that variable to the function that we're passing it to, under the hood, it's gonna actually make a copy of that struct instead. Now that we've implemented the copy trait, we can just remove this clone method. And you see, we don't get an error. We're not explicitly copying some struct, but instead of moving ownership of that to print some struct, it's actually making a copy every time we pass it to a function. So that could be nice if you don't wanna explicitly call dot clone everywhere you need to copy something, but it's also a little bit dangerous in that you might not realize what you're doing. You might not realize that you're making a full copy of some struct every time you pass it to a function. So there are pros and cons to each approach. <laughs> 
But a third way to fix this problem, and probably the one that makes the most sense in our case, is to pass a read-only reference to print sum struct. Because print sum struct doesn't mutate the parameter in any way, we can pass a read-only version of sum struct to the function. In Rust, a read-only reference is a way of handing off a variable without handing off ownership of it. And Rust will allow you to create as many read-only references of a variable as you want. So that's pretty nice. To rewrite print sum struct to take a read-only reference, we're just going to add an ampersand before sum struct. And now you can see we have some errors down here because we're passing the sum struct variable. So to convert these to read-only references, all we have to do is add an ampersand, prefix sum struct with an ampersand, and we're good. So that's another way to completely get rid of this error. In our example, we only have two read-only references here, but you could create 10 if you wanted to. You, you can create as many as you want. Now that we've fixed this, let's run it and make sure that it works. Okay, so we got what we expected. We printed out sum struct twice. Awesome. What if we want to write a function that actually mutates the value of some struct? Rust has something for that called mutable references. Why would you ever use a read-only reference when you can just create a mutable reference? And the reason is that you can create as many read-only references as you want, but for mutable references, you can only have one at a time. So if I make a mutable reference of some struct, I can't have any other references to some struct. Let's see what mutable references look like. We're going to write a function called mutate struct. And for starters, we're going to try having a read-only reference as a parameter. We're going to mutate the value of its only field. And we see we get an error, as we expected. The struct is an ampersand reference, so the data it refers to cannot be written. OK. The way we create a mutable reference is by adding mut after the ampersand. So I just go here and do mut space. Now that reference is mutable, and the function compiles. Now let's try calling mutate struct after the first call to print some struct. And we're going to pass it a reference. So we're passing a mutable reference of sum struct to mutate struct, but it's giving us an error because sum struct itself is not mutable. By default in Rust, everything is read only. So we need to explicitly say sum struct is going to be mutable. So we're going to add mut after let, and that fixes the issue. Now let's run this and see what we got. OK, that's what we expect. So the first print is 3, then we call mutate struct and print it out again, and now it's 5. I did mention that when we create a mutable reference, we can't have any other references to that variable in existence. Let's test that for a second. Instead of creating a reference in the function argument, let's save off that reference before. So struct ref equals some struct. And then let's reference that here, struct ref in a second print statement. And you can see we get an error because we see we cannot borrow some struct as mutable because it's already borrowed as immutable. So we can see it's not letting us create this mutable reference because this read-only reference is still in scope at the time that we create the mutable reference. What we've just covered is known as borrowing and references in Rust. And it's the thing that stops people in their tracks when they're learning Rust. Now we haven't gone super deep on it, but what you just saw are the core concepts. And if you understand those core concepts, the rest of your Rust journey should be downhill. Another concept related to references that folks tend to find tricky is called lifetimes. We're going to start by showing a function that takes references as parameters, but it actually won't compile for reasons we'll see in a minute. This function is going to take two sum struct references, read-only references, and return a sum struct reference. And the function is going to be called biggest. So it's just going to return of the two references that were passed in, it's going to return the sum struct with the biggest num field. We have variable a, variable b, and we simply check the num field of a, see if it's bigger than b. If so, return a, otherwise return b. Pretty simple. But we have a syntax error here. Let's see what it looks like. Missing lifetime specifier. This function's return type contains a borrowed value, but the signature does not say whether it is borrowed from a or b. So the problem here is that the Rust compiler knows that the sum struct reference that's returned is going to be one of the parameters that was passed in. The compiler is trying to make sure that the parameters passed in don't go out of scope and are deallocated before or the value returned by biggest is. Let me show you what I mean. So if I define another sum struct called bigger, uh, we can say sum struct here. And then we add a, just a scope here. And then we do other struct. This one's going to contain a num field of five. So this is going to be the bigger one. If we do bigger equals biggest. and then we print bigger, 
Bigger is in scope when print sum struct is eventually called on line 25, but we can see biggest might return or biggest will return other struct because that's the bigger one, but other struct goes out of scope. Adding explicit lifetimes to the biggest function is what'll make it clear to the Rust compiler that A and B need to stay in scope just as long as a return value. So once we add lifetimes to biggest, we should get an error down here letting us know that, hey, something's wrong. Other struct needs to stay in scope just as long as bigger does. Let's see what adding lifetimes to the biggest function looks like. We specify lifetimes sort of like we specify generics in these angle brackets. So after the function name, we'll do these angle brackets. And the thing that's special about lifetimes when we define them is that they begin with a single quote. So single quote A, that tells the compiler this is not a type, it's a lifetime. And then to specify a lifetime for all these parameters, after the ampersand, we specify single quote A, after the second ampersand, we specify a single quote A, and then the ampersand of the return value, we specify single quote A. This says the A and B parameters need to stay in scope at least as long as the return value for this function. Intuitively, that makes sense because otherwise the return value of the function might become a dangling reference. Now that we've seen what adding lifetimes to the biggest function looks like, let's look at our main function again. We can see we get an error down here. Let's see what it says. Other struct does not live long enough. This is what we want. We know other struct goes out of scope and we know biggest is going to re return other struct as its return value. So bigger is going to be set to other struct. And if we were to use that down here, it would have gone out of scope and potentially been freed. So it's great that we're getting this error at compile time as opposed to runtime. Let's get rid of this extra scope here and make sure other struct lives just as long as bigger and see what happens. Okay, looks good. Let's print it. Num5. Okay, that's exactly what we expect. A few things about lifetimes. Number one is that they're only relevant for references and making sure that we never wind up in a situation where a reference points to some memory that's been freed. The other thing is that they don't change the lifetime of the parameters. They just act as a guide for the compiler to know what you're intending to do with those parameters. The third thing is that sometimes lifetimes can be inferred. For example, if I were to write a function that takes a reference as a parameter and it's one reference and it returns a reference of the same type, the lifetime in that situation is actually Actually inferred. The compiler basically knows that you're going to return that parameter as a return value, and so you don't actually need to specify explicitly lifetimes in that scenario. But functions aren't the only place that we can use lifetimes. We could make a struct that has some read-only references as fields, and lifetimes can come into play there as well. What if instead of num being an i32 field, we were to make it a read-only reference to an i32? Okay, we get a compiler error here, missing lifetime specifier. This is similar to what we were dealing with with the function. If we create some struct, we wanna make sure that the reference that we set the num field to lasts at least as long as this instance of some struct that we just created. So let's see an example of this. Let's define some struct here, create a scope, and then let, let's create an i32, numerics by default are i32 and rust, if they're not floating point, and create some struct here, So we don't have an error yet because we haven't specified a lifetime for some struct, but you can see the problem. We define some struct, the main function scope. We create another scope and we create an i32 inside that scope and then pass a reference to that i32 to the some struct that we create. So after this scope, at this point, num has gone out of scope and potentially been freed. So our some struct would have a field with a dangling reference. Let's see what adding a lifetime to the struct looks like. So again, we use the angle brackets. It's very similar to a generic, but we tell the compiler this is a lifetime instead of a generic type by prefixing it with a single quote. Let's give the num field a lifetime of A and our errors go away. This is telling the compiler that the num field has to last at least as long as some struct. So now down here, we can see we have a compilation error. Num does not live long enough, and that's exactly what we want because that would be a dangling reference if the compiler allowed us to do that. Now we can try getting rid of this extra scope here so that num doesn't get deallocated and we can see everything works. Perfect. What we've covered in this video are borrowing and references and also lifetimes. These are the concepts that stop people in their tracks when they're learning Rust. But if you look at these things in the context of a really simple example, they can be a little bit easier to understand. There are other concepts in Rust that are a little bit challenging, but after you learn lifetimes, references, and borrowing, nothing else will really phase you in the same way because everything else is kind of a different flavor of what you have in other languages. I really hope I made these concepts a little bit easier to understand in this video. I had a blast making it. If you think I got anything wrong or you have any questions, feel free to let me know down in the comments. Other than that, we'll see you in the next one.